Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Policy Talks at the Ford School. I'm Michael Barr, the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm thrilled to be able to be in conversation today with Professor Morella Hernandez. Professor Hernandez is a professor of organizational psychology. Her work uh, operates at the intersection of leadership and diversity. She's an internationally recognized scholar of uh, behavioral science, a deep expert in this area. And she also happens to be a new faculty member at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. So welcome, Morella. Thanks, Michael. It's wonderful to be here and to have, uh, to have joined the team. <laughs> Morella is also, in addition to being an incoming faculty member, the incoming faculty director of the new leadership initiative at the Ford School. Uh, we're very thankful to the Meyer Family Foundation and to the Towsley Foundation for offering support to get us launched in this work. The Ford School Leadership Initiative involves additional courses, coaching, assessments, professional development, extracurricular, co-curricular activities. And all of these are designed to enhance this, our students' ability to lead in this complicated world that we're in now. Uh, so I'm thrilled that Marilla is uh, joining us. I think Marilla is going to uh, get us started with a couple questions for me, and I'm going to ask some <laughs> questions of her, and we'll um, we'll see where it goes from here. Absolutely. I should also say, um, after we're done with this introductory conversation, there's going to be plenty of time for questions and answers, um, questions from the audience. So uh, we've gotten some of those questions in advance, so thank you very much. And we're also gonna take a uh, live question. So uh, it's very easy to send in a question. Uh, you can live chat us through the YouTube channel that many of you are watching on, or you can tweet uh, your question to hashtag policy talks. And we're gonna mix those in as we go. So uh, thanks very much, Morella. And why don't you get us started? Sure. Uh, and I, I would add one more thing is that we have a number of uh, incoming students watching, as well as the general public. So Michael and I will talk a little bit about the leadership uh, initiative in particular and what we're doing, the exciting plans that are coming. Uh, but we'll also talk about leadership in general in terms of uh, you know, our mission and public policy. Uh, so, so yes, I have some questions for you, Michael. Hopefully you can help uh, set the stage. Uh, Basically, why, why did the leadership initiative come about at the Ford School? Well, that's a great question. And I think if you um, look at the history of the Ford School, we have, I think, a very well-deserved reputation for offering excellent quantitative analytic training for our students. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, for me at least, the foundation of being a good leader is knowing your stuff. And we definitely definitely teach our students that. Over time though, I think it became clear that we were not offering the full range of opportunities that we wanted to for our students in terms of developing their leadership skills. And so what we've been doing over the last four years is building systematically those uh, additional steps into the curriculum, additional courses on leadership, leading diverse organizations, public management, nonprofit management, courses in conflict resolution, negotiation. Uh, so we began to build up that side of the curriculum. And as we were building up the curricular side, we also said, well, other things need to come into play too. It's not just in the classroom. So uh, part of that involves things like capstone courses and strategic public policy consulting courses to give students real world opportunities to experiment with their leadership skills. And then lastly, you know, as we'll talk about a little bit down the road, we've added on co-curricular activities, leadership assessment, leadership coaching, uh, professional development, that's really integral to the whole package of suite of skills that I think students need in this area. 
Well, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, and for those of us, or for those of you watching, Michael and I have been talking about this leadership initiative for, for a long time. And it was really a pleasure to get to know the Ford School in particular in terms of all the activities that are already ongoing. And so really, I feel like I'm coming into the most fortunate of situations, standing on the shoulder of giants in that a number of faculty have already made great strides in revising the curriculum to do what exactly what Michael is talking about, really inculcate the type of skills and experiences that are beneficial for leadership development. Uh, from my perspective, I think you know part of my mission in, in stepping into this role is to bring it all together into a co cohesive, transformative experience for the students so that you know from the moment that uh, students get here and they're able to take, for example, an assessment, a leadership assessment to deepen their self-understanding, that leadership assessment is essentially a snapshot, right? And, and can we provide then different periods of time where individuals, you know, in their experience at the Ford School can reflect, can understand how they're growing and, and set their aspirations in a very uh, intentional way. I think that's a great way of putting it, Morella, and, and we're super excited to have you here. As Morella said, we've been talking about this uh, together for a long time. Going back to when I first um, reached out to Morella to try and recruit her to the school, and um, once Morella was hired back um, in January and February, she started right in on working <laughs> with us um, on this new initiative. So I'm super excited um, to have uh, her now joining us officially uh, now in, uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, Morella, I might um, start in by asking you to reflect a bit on what we describe as leadership uh, yeah. at the Ford School. So at the Ford School, we describe leadership as the behavioral process of having a positive impact on individuals, organizations, and communities. And I'd say in our context, we're focused on that definition in advancing the public good, core, core to our mission. How does that resonate with you? Does that capture <laughs> what you think of as the, the core components of what leadership might mean? Well, I, it resonates on, on several different levels. I would say if it didn't resonate personally, I wouldn't be here. And for those uh, <laughs> colleagues who are watching and know that much of my research is in stewardship when it relates to leadership. So really, how can we behave as caretaker of the resources that have been entrusted to us? Uh, and think through the long-term implications of our decisions. To me, that's very you know, close and dear to my heart. I, I find that you know, the, the responsibility of leaders is so great in developing others and understanding how future generations will be impacted by the decisions that they make today. So on a personal level, it resonates completely. Uh, on, a, on a scholarly level, I would say, you know, uh, First of all, I mean, I was impressed when I started talking uh, to you, Michael, and others of the faculty that the Ford School has a defined way of looking at leadership. Working with so many different organizations over the past 20 years, I can tell you that it is very rare for an organization to uh, codify exactly what is leadership in this context and then put it into um, you know, a definition that is used widely and there's a, a, a consensus around it. So to me, that signals that the values of the Ford School are strong, that they are consistent with how the school is run, and that it's forward looking and external looking to the impact our students uh, will have on society. Um, so, so let me say, because in, in the scholarly work I've done, a lot of research and can tell you over the past hundred years, there's been very little um, uh, consensus in how scholars approach mm -hmm. leadership. Now, over the past 20 to 30 years, there's been much more um, overlapping uh, understanding that leadership is a process and that very much is reflected in this definition. Leadership is uh, a process of self-discovery and self-development that is uh, really a way of developing others, influencing others toward a common goal. Um, and so it absolutely resonates with how we conceptualize leadership and um, 
and and certainly on a personal level, it's uh, it's something that I uh, that I admire. Thanks, Morella. Um, maybe we could take a step back. You know, yeah. Sometimes when I'm talking to people about leadership, there's kind of a perception: well, you're either a leader or you're not. You can't yeah. really learn how to be a leader. You can't really teach how to be a leader. Um, obviously, that's not the approach we're taking in the Ford School. Yeah. And your, your career, your career is dedicated to the idea that maybe it's possible to teach leadership. So I wonder if you could reflect on, you know, why people have that perception, and then maybe, Absolutely. you know, what what does the research tell us about the question? Yeah, I mean, I, and you know, Michael, I get this question all the time, right? Can you teach leadership? Obviously, this is, you know, the name of um, of this particular segment is learning leadership mm -hmm. because uh, question mark, right? Because, question mark. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Can you so, can you learn and, leadership? Well, I yeah, I can tell you yes. Um, not that it's easy, right? But you know, all worthy aims <laughs> are challenging, uh, and they take not only effort, but consistent effort and discipline in, um, in developing the type of skills that we hope will get us where we want to go. And so in terms of leadership, you know, what we know from research is that, um, let's say, you know, specifically, you know, 30% of what we perceive as leadership are uh, the, the stable traits and characteristics of our personality. And, uh, you know, my, my original training is in psychology, and I can tell you that after our early 20s, our personalities are kind of set. And so we're kind of stuck with, with what we've got uh, for the, for the large, uh, you know, large part, in large part. Um, but that's 30%. 70% of what leadership is perceived to be is what we choose to do with that 30%. How do we choose to understand our tendencies, for example, our propensity to act a certain way. And can we develop right, the choice to behave perhaps in a slightly different way? Because the role of leadership, which is one that is public and one that you know, others are counting on us for, uh, demands certain behaviors and certain responsibilities to be fulfilled. So that's what I mean by choice. So you can certainly, you know, as many academics who are total introverts, but, you know, but majority of their job involves, you know, stepping into a classroom with 100 people, you know, they can tell you that it might be a hard choice, but it is certainly a doable choice step over up. time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. This is something you can practice. Um, and so that's, that's the core of of how I view um, teaching leadership is that you know it is a combination, but ultimately it is a behavioral choice that we make in displaying specific leadership behaviors. Um, thanks, Morella. We'll get we'll dive into some of the yeah. ways that you teach those skills in in just a bit. Um, how do you think about coming to the Ford School? The Ford School is a public policy school. Mm -hmm. You have recently been a distinguished professor at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. How do you think the transition will go? What are the, what are the reasons that attract you to be in the Ford School? What are the similarities and differences and, and how you think about leadership? Just a small little question. <laughs> uh, and it's one I've been thinking about mm -hmm. quite a bit uh, in that it, it, it has been a big move. But I will tell you that um, at the University of Virginia and the Darden School in particular, it, the Darden School sets the standard for world-class teaching in MBA programs. Um, and not to, to, um, to you know, give any sort of competition to our uh, business school, Ross, but I think many of my colleagues at Ross would, would tell you that some of the best teachers in the world are at the Darden School. And you know, I benefited tremendously from mentorship and, um, and, and really being able to learn as much from my colleagues at Darden as possible uh, regarding student-centered learning. This idea that you know, what we're bringing into the classroom, it's not that I'm walking in with a set of slides and here you go, this is what we show students every single year, but the philosophy behind it is that I'm gonna meet you where you are and I'm gonna take you where you didn't even know you wanted to go. I'm gonna take you to that next level of understanding, um, of analytical development, of self-discovery and self-inquiry. 
and, and do it in a way that is true to our values. And so that's what I hope I'm bringing here as, you know, as a result of, of benefiting from those relationships. Um, the other, th I think the other part that will allow me to contribute to the Ford School, and again, to contribute to efforts that are already ongoing, is that at Darden, I was, uh, what you know, the course had essentially developed the person in charge of developing the leadership curriculum for all incoming MBA students, both at, you know, what we would say are sort of our MPPs, the mm -hmm. master's level, and sort of the executive format, which is sort of like our MPAs. Um, and, and what I can tell you is that, you know, I was fortunate to be with a group of scholars who were also experts in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion matters. And to my mind, not just because of my research, but I think probably also informed by my own uh, personal identity and my own both personal and professional experiences as a Hispanic woman, is that you know leadership and issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion are absolutely intertwined. Um, this idea of self-discovery has to involve understanding our personal biases, mm -hmm. perhaps our blind spots. What is it? How is it that our experiences have evolved to create a lens through which we interpret the world? And most importantly, to leadership what are we missing? Hmm. Right? Can we have the vulnerability and um, the openness to understand, you know, that we all have blind spots and, and the, the, the sort of learning orientation to approach and, and develop those skills that perhaps uh, are hardest to develop for us personally. So I think this issue of, uh, you know, integrating issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the training and development of future leaders and to do so in a learning perspective that is true to our students, their experiences, their aspirations are things that I'm bringing with me to the Ford School. Well, now, that's great. Yeah, sure. No, no, go, go ahead. Did you want to jump in? Uh, well, you know, the only thing I would say is that, um, so the reason that I came, so I, so, it's it's uh it's a question I've gotten before. So if you know if Darden was a wonderful place, why did you leave? Right, which would be the the um, the next question. And I would say, you know, it's really hard to leave a place that um, there's, there's sort of nothing wrong with it, right? Like it was wonderful. And um, back to this issue of stewardship, you know, I I feel a deep sense of calling to apply my my skills and my perspective and whatever I, however I can help our students develop in a way that will, you know, maximize the public good. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you can do that in private industry to a great extent, but given the state of our country, I could not think of a better place to apply, you know, everything that I can bring and everything that I can learn from the faculty, the staff and the students here at the Ford school to, to improve, the state of the, the world and the U.S. in particular. Thanks, Morella. There, there's a lot to unpack in what you said. I'm gonna <laughs> no, I mean it's very rich and and deep. And so I want to I'm gonna pick a few things out, and maybe we'll have a little bit of a conversation around that. One one of the really interesting thing, the things you said was about vulnerability. Yeah. Um, I found in my own experience in leadership. This is an area that confuses people. A lot of leaders who are, a lot of leaders make mistakes because they think that they have to project an image of infallibility and all knowingness. Um, and they're not able to be vulnerable or to um, be open to other people's ideas or to admit when they've messed up. So I, I really resonate with that. I think it's absolutely essential trait of leadership. How do you help people understand that and develop the skills that are required to act on it? Yeah, well, so let me first say that, Michael, I've, yeah, I've, I've uh, only seen you in person uh, very little, <laughs> but right. I've seen you in enough Zoom meetings where I've seen you display vulnerability with faculty, um, with staff, 
And, uh, you know, I think that if we were to ask your faculty and staff, like this idea of relatability mm -hmm. um, and vulnerability are very much tied. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've, you know, I, I, you might see me in Zoom meetings where I'm smiling and it's because I'm like, he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so good on you. Um, it is the most, I would say vulnerability for top level leaders is one of the most powerful tools in their toolkit. Mm -hmm. It is, it changes the dynamic of not just the conversation, but how you relate and interact with others. And I think that the, the more experienced and the more seasoned you become, the easier it actually is to, to, to use the tool of vulnerability in that, you know, successful people have made a lot of mistakes and they're successful because they've learned from those mistakes. And they're successful because they haven't denied the fact that they've made those mistakes, but rather they've embraced the fact that that was a learning opportunity. And so with age and experience and, um, and you know, greater sensitivity to those times where we may not know everything, we're able to use that vulnerability. Now, for, for the other side of the spectrum, in that, you know, in, in my consulting and teaching experiences, I, I've, I teach individuals who are an undergrad and they're 17, 18 years old mm -hmm. to individuals who, you know, on their fourth retirement, our third <laughs> company, and they're in their 70s and 80s and they're yeah. still going at it. So I, so I get to see the sort of life cycle of a, of a leader. Uh, and what I've noticed uh, is that the younger we are, the harder time we have mm -hmm. with showing vulnerability. And that makes sense in terms of where we are developmentally and in our career. Uh, what happens with, um, you know, our really bright students, both in undergrad and then transferring into a master's program, is that the world is, is really set up to reward our achievements, right? I mean, even just at, how do you apply to college? How do you apply to a master's program? We tell people what we have done, how we have performed, right? And you're an individual contributor in that way. And that makes sense, right? Because that's no, you haven't been in charge of other people necessarily. Now, what I find to be most interesting is that when we see individuals, in particular the master's level, so the our MPA and our MPP students, that there typically is a paradigm shift in how they are, they not only approach, but really it's imposed upon them, this paradigm shift that they no longer are individual contributors because that's not good enough when you're uh, evaluated, not on your individual performance, but in the performance of others, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're, you're put in charge of others, it's not what you do, it's how do you facilitate, right? The learning and the skills of others. So you can no longer be an individual contributor. That paradigm shift has to occur so that you're able to develop the future leaders of, of, your, uh, of your unit or your organization um, or, or, or whatever it may be. So that vulnerability, I think, is, is, is hardest at that younger uh, stage in our careers, but with greater sensitivity to leadership as a process and one that requires us to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes, it gets easier um, you know, through those experiences. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of echo. Let's see if we can get it out of the system. Yeah. So, Michael, um, I'm going to ask you a question since we're okay. talking about learning. So yeah. what's been your biggest leadership challenge? Uh, Morella, there's um, life has given me many opportunities to learn humility. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would say, um, you know, leading the school during this pandemic has been really, really challenging. Um, I'm so proud of how the Ford School has done in the pandemic. Uh, it's been really, really difficult, though. It was difficult to work our way through it, to make good decisions, to operate in the constrained environment we're in, and to keep everybody together. And I think one of the things the Ford School did exceedingly well is uh, stay together as a strong community. And I think I attribute a lot of that to our shared mission. Uh, we we are really are dedicated to the public good, and so our faculty pivoted quickly, our students and staff pivoted quickly, 
to focus on how we all could help others. Mm -hmm. And I think that brought us together in a really important way. And um, it also gave us something to work on that wasn't worrying about ourselves all the time. Uh, and so I think, I think we came through this um, really well. I, the other thing I'd, I'd say about it is, um, you know, I tried to stay in really close communication with the community during the pandemic. And, and I do think that our communication helped. Um, and, and back to our other conversation, I, I wasn't scared to be vulnerable, or I should say I was scared to be vulnerable, but I did it. <laughs> I did, did it anyway. I did it so anyway. Give, give us an example of the type of communication um, that you thought helped. Well, I decided when we pivoted, um, when COVID hit and we pivoted to remote teaching mm -hmm. and learning and work um, for the rest of that semester to write an email every day um, to the community, um, just checking in. Uh, a lot of it was not do this, don't do that. Um, most of it was not that. Most of it was just checking in. And I tried to let people know that it was okay to be scared or down about the situation that we were in, uh, but to provide maybe some strategies that people could use to cope with that, whether that's you know personal strategies, exercise, meditation, checking in with friends, uh, or whether that's um, uh, the kind of work we're talking about in terms of finding things outside ourselves to focus on. I, I think that helped. Yeah. And it was very much a, a school-wide effort. So Associate Dean Paula Lance um, was regularly communicating. Marcy Brighton, our Chief Administrative Officer, was regularly communicating with the staff. Susan Gindy, um, who runs our student services um, division, and then others um, along the way, we had some kind of guest communicators um, who joined in uh, too. And I think that level of communication uh, was helpful in binding us together or keeping us together. Which is so hard to do when there's such a high level of uncertainty, right? Yes. In that yeah. You're, I think you're dealing with a whole bunch of stuff, but then you, you're also communicating out as, as best you can. I think the important thing to do there, Morella, is to be honest and transparent about the uncertainty. Again, I think sometimes leaders make mistakes because they feel that the way that they make people feel better about the uncertain environment is mm -hmm. to claim that it's not uncertain, that everything's clear. And that just, people really can't, respond to that because they know it's not true. I mean, it's, <laughs> so you have to be really honest with people about the uncertainty yeah. and give them tools to cope with the uncertainty. Absolutely. And, and I, so I think that's, yeah. I think that's pretty critical. Well, so I, in, in, in psychology uh, and organizational behavior, we always talk about this cognitive overload, no. right? And and I think many of us, if not all, experienced some cognitive overload in the past year. And I love what you're saying in terms of you know being able to be honest about it. You know, I, I the, the the extent to which we can understand everything that's going on when when our emotions are heightened, mm -hmm. right? Typically, we we turn into the sort of tunnel vision right. state. Yeah. And, um, and which can be helpful in focusing us on problem solving. So it's adaptive. It, absolutely. But, but it creates but, other issues. If you're stuck in that state um, and you're not able to, uh, to, to be able to make decisions um, because you don't have all the information, then, um, then that th drives you into decision making yeah. paralysis. Morella, we, we try at the Ford School, as you know, to focus on these three elements of, of management, managing oneself, mm -hmm. managing others, and then managing organizations. And it, I think it's, in part, it, it recognizes that we lead from where we are. Yes. Not everybody is the CEO of a company or the head of a nonprofit or the secretary of a department in the federal government. We're, we lead from where we are. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could say a little bit about how to think about leading from where where one is, as opposed to this. Some people have this idea of leadership as 
you know, you're not a leader unless you are the head of the organization. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I'd, I'd love your thoughts about, about that. Well, I mean, I think this is, this gets to the heart of leadership in that we, leadership isn't about formal authority and formal power. It's not about title. It's not about position. What leadership is about is influence. And that's a very different thing because you have the ability to influence others from wherever you are. And so in developing these leadership skills, you know, what I often talk about is, you know, you're, you lead down to if you have you know direct reports um or you're you know you're mentoring others in sort of a different and earlier developmental stage you lead laterally to your peers and i think the the part that often gets uh, ignored is you also lead up right we mm -hmm. often forget that our own supervisors our bosses our leaders are actually people that are figuring things out. Of course, yeah. you know, we hope <laughs> they have some level of expertise and background that makes them better positioned to make those big decisions. But if we approach them as individuals who are essentially there to tell us what to do or, to, or there to constrain our behavior or there to just sort of be at a distance, we're missing out from the type of mutual influence that can emerge uh, when we think about you know, leadership as an influence rather than just sort of a directive process. Um, totally so that agree. starts, yeah, yeah. That, that's how we begin to think about it. When you think about leading up in that way, there, mm -hmm. as you said, there's leading yourself, there's leading your peers, but there's also this leading up. Can you tell us a little bit about how to learn from a good leader who you're working for and how to help a leader who has management challenges? <laughs> Because you, you need to do both, right? You do. You so do. how do you how do you learn from a good leader? How do you help a leader who who's not all that they could be yet? Right. Well, I would say the 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 first question is probably a a, a more uh, straightforward one, and and I would I I, I would um, also shine a light on the fact that you know right now this summer, um, what I. It, we, we've launched this this coaching program and it's been through career services. Um, you know, Jennifer Niggermeyer was the um, the mastermind behind it. Uh, and you said I started working you know, earlier th in the winter. I mean, I partnered with Jennifer to hire a suite of coaches so that our MPP students this summer could have individual personal coaching. So why am I telling you this? This is at the key of uh, many of our coaching conversations this summer is how do you learn from the individuals around you, right? And um, and what it what what we know is that really development happens with three factors. One is you have to seek out challenges, and and certainly at the Ford School we offer our students a whole suite of challenges that they can take on, and the internship for the MPPs that's a cornerstone of the program and and that is a challenge they're they they are stretching their capabilities um so that you know they can further their ability to 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 contribute the way that they want to contribute um post-graduation and so you know to so seek out challenges you know they're doing it um the other is approach with a learning orientation so you have to approach these challenges as um you know circumstances that allow us to adapt, mm -hmm. um, to learn about ourselves. And, and the coaching component is so central to uh, really facilitating the reflection that has to happen when, you know, for, for, for students and others to learn. We have to be able to, you know, get away from the day-to-day -day of our job and even if it's just a 20 minute conversation or 30 minute mm -hmm. conversation, be able to think about what did I do really well? What am I proud of? Mm -hmm. Right. What are the things that I'm, I'm still working on? And, and am I making progress for that? Or do I need to shift my uh, my focus or my strategies? Right. That's the learning is happening. And, it you know, on, quite honestly, uh, to to my great surprise, because these coaching programs are coaching programs that are typically very exclusive 
to private industry and top level managers. But because of the generous support of our donors, our students have this gift of having the support they need to learn from the challenges that they're undertaking. And then, you know, finally, I'd say feedback. Feedback is such a, an important part of learning from others, learning from our experiences. Uh, and, and as we near the end of the summer, part of this process is, is really kicking off. I'm going to talk to, you know, um, half of the group next week and then the other half the following week. And, and the, the process is really like, you know, taking the summer experience, processing it, and, and being able to receive feedback from, from career services, from others, um, from their peers, so that it solidifies the learnings um, going forward. So, you know, just putting a structure behind it, right? Seeking out yeah. challenges, uh, approaching those challenges with a learning orientation and getting feedback on that learning are the components of development. Um, and that's how our, our students and others can really get the most out of um, the interactions they have. That sounds really, really helpful, really helpful. Morella, when, when, when things are going, things are going well, well, you have a good have environment, a environment to be in, and you can learn from it. it. You know, that's yeah. super helpful. What happens if things are a little awry? So, yeah. you know, how does a, how should a young person going out in the world think about what happens when the management they're getting is causing problems? Yes. Is there, is there a way for them to speak to their boss? Right. That can so, help their boss learn too. Well, and so, so that the second question you asked me is, you know, if a leader isn't doing well, how can they improve? Right. But let's how take that. The, how can the young person help the leader? Exactly. Improve? Right. Yeah. So, you know, you actually can't change other people. The person has to make a choice to change. Right. That that we only change our behaviors if we choose to focus on altering our actions, our attitudes, our interactions, and so mm -hmm. forth, right? So, so from uh, one of our students' perspectives, you're dealing with a boss that is is perhaps not a good leader. And and I do, you know, in in speaking to um, students and clients, you know, there is a difference between what makes a really good leader and a really good manager. Um, oftentimes, people are both. You know, those are roles. We're both managers and leaders. Managers execute on a pre you know, determined set of tasks, typically on some sort of timeline or schedule, right? You're 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 there to execute. Um, with with leadership, you're not there to just carry out a pre-determined uh, plan. You're there to create, to generate, to generate. All right, and so that generative activity is very different. Um, now, some of our students might have really good managers, um, supervisors that are managers, right? And, and but terrible leaders, <laughs> hmm. um, and, or vice versa, where an individual is all about creating, but they never actually execute, right? And so I would I would argue both are are important. So you know the short answer, which which uh, which many social psych psychologists and social scientists in general use often, is it depends. In terms of how do you That's approach that That's a lawyer's that answer, Morella. We use that too. <laughs> well, I am married to a lawyer, so I, you know, maybe it's rubbing off on, right. <laughs> on me. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I think um, part of the coaching process is to individualize the type of um, advice and counsel to the student's experience. And so I think, again, it's such a, a amazing resource for students. Um, if I were to provide a blanket uh, recommendation, is this, this is going back to the fact that your leader is a fallible human being, your manager is a fallible human being, and they may not be doing what is irking you the most in an intentional way. Um, and so, you know, part of my sort of life philosophy and one that I transmit to the classroom is you always assume positive intent. And if you are able to have a conversation with your boss, not as between intern and boss, but as human and human with respect um, and learn from that individual, what are they struggling with? It might be that they're not paying attention to you because 
their personal life is blowing up or they're dealing with a 101 crisis and those crises are confidential and they can't tell you about it. Um, and so being able to give people the benefit of the doubt and approach situations like that um, is just, a, again, a blanket recommendation that is, is good for life in general. One caveat to all of this, uh, and, and I think this is an important caveat, is that there is a difference between you know, a boss that's a bad manager or a bad leader and a boss that is abusive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in, in my field, you would call it abusive supervision. Um, uh, uh, there's a line there where if it's impacting you know, our students' mental health or if it, if it gets to a point where you know, it's, it, it is, um, it's beyond the scope of, of what we would expect. I mean, Jennifer, who leads career services here, is in touch with every single one of our students and and what i love 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 about her and her office is that they're looking out for any potential red flags so beyond sort of the normal scope of development like she is she and her team are there mm -hmm. to ensure that our students are being taken care of well and so so that's my caveat is you know there's there's work struggles there's a line. Line. yeah but we don't we certainly wouldn't want it to get to a point where um, where our students are are having uh, a, a really terrible experience, and you know, if from from everything that I uh, I am learning and have have heard, I mean, th those are exceptional circumstances. To my mind, they they have not happened. But it's as someone who worked in the late '90s at Enron as my first job. <laughs> so you saw the other way. I saw what happens after you cross that line, and that was not a good situation. So it's right. always something I'm aware of um, and very vigilant to prevent. Um, Morella, we have quite a lot of audience yes. questions coming in, so I'm going to weave those into the conversation. Uh, the first one is, how can we leverage leadership skills to foster a more welcoming and diverse environment? that prioritizes the needs of marginalized people? Yeah, um, such an important question. So as we think about environment, right, a context, part of the reason that teaching leadership and learning how to be a leader is important because is because what it allows you to do is to shape the environment. Right. So we can talk about our own behaviors and how we interact with others and how do we see differences, understand differences, um, understand ourselves, understand how our own identities, you know, create different lenses. I mean, we can see that right at sort of the individual and, and group level. Where leadership is such an important tool, to my mind, is when you are operating with a, within a system. Right. Uh, an organization is a system you know, um, our environment is a system where you have inputs, right? And, and let's just say in any organization, you're being hired, you're being trained, you're being evaluated. That's what I mean by a system. Um, leaders have the ability to change the type of, uh, you know, design elements, the elements, the factors that allow people certain boundaries to interact it sort of gives us guardrails on, you know, how is it that we do things around here and how is it that we don't do things around mm -hmm. here? Um, so codes of conduct is a really, um, really, I think, perhaps common and sometimes overused uh, uh, go to. Uh, most importantly, it's processes that allow us to understand how to serve those that are not in the majority. Um, and I'll give you a really specific example that is an academic example, um, a personal example. So I, I, you know, before I was at, at University of Virginia, I was at a different university, University of Washington, and and I had my daughter who is now 12 years old. And I remember asking, um, you know, HR, you know, what what is what is the process for maternity leave? Mm -hmm. And um, and it turns out that because they had not had any women faculty of childbearing age. Wow. <laughs> they, they didn't have one and not for faculty, right? So they said, okay, well, let's look at the staff. 
uh -huh. um, policy, which is fair, um, with the exception that, you know, as faculty, we teach and we teach on an on a academic calendar and somehow pregnancy doesn't listen to this academic calendar. And so that was a process and that was a, a spark um, to, 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 to a conversation that led to some policy changes. And, and again, assuming positive intent, it's not that the university didn't, didn't want or wanted to exclude, right, um, women faculty, but rather they were in such the minority that policies and procedures had not been developed for them. And from the minority, you know, underrepresented category perspective, we think they don't want me here. I don't belong. Right. But from a leadership perspective, it's how do, how should I be more proactive, not just with this issue, but from uh, with other underrepresented groups, where unwittingly, and again, benefit of the doubt, unwittingly, we are creating an environment that does not um, attend to some of the most basic uh, needs and responsibilities that that we have uh, in this institution. Yeah, Morella, that's a great point. And sometimes it's policies and procedures, and sometimes it's the lived environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we just went through the process of um, last year adding a gender neutral bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're right now building a space for a lactation space. Mm -hmm. And these are things that totally make sense to have in the building, but the building was not built with the, the range of people in mind that it should have. That's, um, well, and again, it's you know it's a process, right. the evolution of you know our workplace. It's good to be uh, making these adjustments, um, and and I think the responsibility of leaders lies in not sitting back, right? Wait until these adjustments are sort of demanded, right? <laughs> legally or otherwise, <laughs> but really being. Um, proactive and and future oriented and thinking about if this is the type of workforce that I want to create, if this is the type of environment that I want to reflect. Yeah. What, what do we building? need? What do we yeah. need to do? Yeah. Policies, procedures, the building looks like yeah. all of yeah. that is super important. Let's uh, let's grab another question here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, th this one is actually near and dear to my heart because I am married to an introvert and have a couple Two of my three kids have some introverted qualities about them. The question is, um, and, and you can tell I'm not an introvert. Here's the, here's the question. Extroverted traits are often associated with leadership, being outgoing, comfortable with crowds, et cetera. But what do introverts bring to the table as leaders? Yeah, yeah, and I think, I, I actually think it's a misconception that that Me too. leaders are extroverted and you know introverts can't be um, leaders. I so to be to be clear, let's think about introversion and extroversion in terms of um, you know where do you get your energy? Typically, that's that's how um, you know in, in psychology we start thinking about introversion, extroversion. How do you how do you approach life in terms of where are you going to for your energy? And extroverts get their energy from other people. Right. It's like, you know, solar cells and they're sort of receiving and absorbing all of this energy and introverts. And by the way, Michael, I am much more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. Um, are, I'll are keep that not, in mind. I know it's just and people look at me and they're like, no, you're not. It's like, yeah, you know, my ideal, you know, uh, Sunday is being in my garden, not talking to people. Uh -huh. <laughs> You know, my my kids who are 12 and 15, you know, they often find me on the couch and they're like, what are you doing? And it's just, I'm just quiet. I'm just thinking. <laughs> so, so this idea that that only, you know, extroverts um, bring things to the table in leadership, I think, is, is a misconception when especially we start to look at what are the what are the um, foundational skills to be a leader? And I would I would. You know, I can talk a lot about this. Let me just put three out there that are sort of anchors, they're building blocks. One is the thing that you started out with um, today, Michael, is like this is idea of competence, right? And expertise. And the fact that, you know, at the Fords, we are so good at developing that expertise and competence, analytical minds, right? 
And, and that is not an extroversion, introversion type of thing. That is, do you know your stuff? Right. The other, uh, I would say- We used to have an expression, by the way, when I worked at Treasury, we had this expression, what's your ratio of views to facts? And if your ratio is out of whack, people really just didn't want to hear from you anymore. How does hold up, that hold up in academia, Michael? <laughs> Uh, we, we insist on it at the Ford School. I mean, that's the whole point of what you were just saying. You got to know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Yes, for the students. Sometimes I tease my faculty colleagues about that. Um, yeah. So, so you know, I think with with sort of this anchor, that's part of what we have, right? Um, at the Ford School, and introverts are certainly no less likely to develop it than extroverts. I think, um, you know, that's not a non-issue. Um, second anchor is how do we develop relationships? And I think this is where the misconception comes in, in that extroverts will, will seek out relationships, but that the number of relationships is not what leadership is about. It's, um, I, I always describe it as information gathering when you develop relationships, like, what do you learn about this person? You know, what makes them tick? Um, what do they love about their job? I mean, a, a question I always ask people when, when I, um, I'm getting to know them is like, do you like your job? Uh -huh. Um, which, which for, for a lot of people are like, I haven't been asked that, but, but uh -huh. it, it gets to, gets to this idea of like, what makes someone tick? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Can you, can you deeply immerse yourself in who this person is? And Extroversion and introversion has nothing to do with it. Um, an introvert with sort of a, you know, a, a careful approach to that information gathering is just as likely to learn about a person than an extrovert. Um, so again, it's this depth, not breath. And then a third anchor um, that I would say is one that we are going to focus on with these curricular developments, you know, even more so um, now at the Ford School, is this ability to understand the context, again, this system, because it's not only enough to know your stuff, right, to be personally capable. It's not enough to develop these strong relationships and, and really learn about other people. But as a leader, you need to take both of those components and put them into action. How, so as a leader, how do you put the right person in the right role? How do you, how do you develop you know, the right process given all of the dynamics that naturally emerge, especially within a political context, right? How, those nuances of how the moving parts, right, are arranged and the levers that you have to move them. That's the contextual piece. And again, introversion, extroversion, you know, I think extroverts might go at it differently than introverts. Extroverts might go at it by learning to, you know, from a whole, suite of individuals, again, seeking out people, whereas um, introverts might think much more about different sources of information mm -hmm. that are not necessarily interpersonally based, but both get to the same yeah. place. Um, those are skills that anyone can develop. That's great. Uh, really helpful. Um, um, let's take let's one more, more question, question and then, I, and then from the audience, audience I've got a final one for you. Um, okay. um, this question is, what leadership lessons are we learning from Simone Biles and others who are putting their personal mental health above their performance imperatives? And a further implication, are we going to hear more about how to balance these issues in the wake of the pandemic? Well, you know, I, I think that's, that's a question that's really relevant for you, um, Michael, in, in how you're considering reentry. Um, of our students, because I've heard you speak already a number of different times in the past few months as that being one of your primary concerns. The fact that there's a lot that's happened in the past year and our students have experienced all different types of trauma. How do we attend to that? Do you want to speak a little bit about how you're thinking uh, through sort of the tangible reentry of, of our students in the fall? Uh, thanks, Morella. Yeah, uh, mental health issues, I think, are have been an issue in the past, and I'm concerned about the mental health experiences that our students, faculty, and staff have had during the pandemic. I know people have struggled 
many people have struggled quite a bit during the pandemic. And there have been differential impacts on different communities. Um, you know, if you um, are an African American person living in Detroit, your chances of getting COVID or knowing somebody who got COVID or knowing somebody who died from COVID are, are much higher and your, your personal experiences will have been much different than they were for me living in Ann Arbor um, with my experiences. And so, you know, trying to recognize that there's been this differential impact of the pandemic on people, uh, trying to be attentive to what people call a trauma-informed approach uh, to support. So really paying attention to people where they are, understanding the differential impact, focusing on issues of equity, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that we are empowering people to make choices that will be helpful for them in their path, uh, being very transparent about what we're doing, making sure we're focused on uh, trusted relationships, these are all elements of a trauma-informed approach that mm -hmm. I think will serve us well in the fall. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're building that kind of scaffolding. We have uh, been able to secure uh, having a CAPS embedded counselor um, for the Ford School, who we share with the School of Education. And mm -hmm. that's been really helpful during the pandemic. That was something that was missing before and that we'll continue to have access to in the future. So those are some of the things we're, we're thinking about at Ford. And I, I do think this um, example of Simone Biles, who's just such a, I mean, phenomenal athlete, the top, easily the top uh, gymnast, um, certainly of her time, and who's performed at a level that no one has seen before. I mean, the, the feats that she's been able to do, um, nobody else has been willing to even try. I mean, so, but to be able, for her to be able to understand where she is in her own space and what she needs to be healthy um, seems to me a really quite remarkable um, example. And I wonder whether you might offer some lessons from that that others could, could build on. Well, I, I think it, it, it goes back to a central um, tenet that, that we've been uh, mentioning over and over, this idea of, of self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and what I have heard, you know, teaching uh, hundreds and hundreds of students over the past year uh, in the pandemic is that it's been a really odd experience where, in particular in, in American culture, you know, we go, go, go. And, right. uh, and we're, you know, typically overscheduled and, and there's very little time for reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and there's even less time to, to even to understand how our experiences over over years, right, change, you know, and shift our priorities. So for many people, the pandemic has um, has offered this welcome or unwelcome uh, opportunity to be with themselves and think about, you know, mm -hmm. am I good with where I am right now? Are, what are the things that are helping me? What are the things that are detracting from, from where I want to be? Um, and so this issue of mental health is really complex because trauma is a big part of it. But this idea of um, self-understanding is, is, an, is another part of it. Um, I think if you're a student and, and at the Ford School in particular, there's a scaffolding of support to help. I think in the broader public, you know, there, there hasn't been the benefit of what an academic environment offers, which is solidarity, which is community, which is support, which is resources. And so that's been um, a really big problem. And in the workforce, you know, we're seeing that people are not going back to work. There's a labor shortage. And, and it's not just, you know, uh, uh, that people don't want to go back to work or they're collecting unemployment. Uh, you know, that's a myth. Uh, that that that's going to drive everybody to never find a job again, but rather, you know, people are very um, contemplative about their mm -hmm. lives at this moment and really thinking before I dive into something else, what is it that I want to do? And I, I would put that in the mental health category and to mm -hmm. the extent that we can um, self-discover, self-understand and, and take the steps 
to allow us to realize our potential, you know, those are all um, amazingly positive um, things. That's great, Morella. So I think we have time for just for one last um, question. And we've talked a little bit about where we've been in the past. So we have uh, dramatically expanded our course offerings in this area. We now have our masters of public policy students uh, taking the opportunity to have leadership coaching, um, mm -hmm. anybody who wants it with their internship. We have leadership assessments for our incoming students. I hope um, uh, everybody uh, who's listening either has taken it or will take the leadership assessment because really critical tool. Our undergraduate students are getting leadership assessment in their uh, one of their introductory courses as a core part of that. Where do you see the leadership initiative going? What are you excited about? I don't I don't expect you to have mapped out the next five years, but can you can you share with our um, listeners some things you're excited about over the next year? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, there there are a couple of sort of buckets, one being that we what you're talking about are sort of the, the, the offerings, the, the pieces of the puzzle that allow us to um, to really formulate a comprehensive suite of skills or skill building opportunities. Mm -hmm. And and I think that with now, you know, every MPP student being able to have, um, you know, executive leadership coaching, that's amazing. The next step, uh, which will be this upcoming year, and thank you, Michael, and thank you to our donors for making it possible, the MPA students mm -hmm. will also have that opportunity. Um, career services is also, you know, doing um, uh, a number of different, they're, they're focusing on different initiatives to serve our undergrad students to provide the same type of feedback and support. And so uh, the, the one bucket is like, we're gonna keep ramping up, right? What's already in place. And we're gonna keep doing that um, so that we, uh, we truly build toward a comprehensive um, suite of, of resources. And, um, and so that's, that's one thing I think is so positive. There's great momentum um, that, that we'll capitalize on. A second bucket is uh, the curriculum. And you know, I think that this is just starting out in terms of um, some of the major changes that we've made have taken effect during the pandemic. And as, as faculty come back um, and we're able to actually see each other and interact informally um, you know, I've, I've witnessed just how like the intellectual horsepower of our faculty. I mean, I, I, it's a pleasure <laughs> every, every talk, every conversation. I mean, it's, they're pretty amazing. And so as we come back into the office, the opportunities for sort of cross pollination of ideas, um, you know, applying that to course development, um, and, and, and really focusing on how do we take it an, an interdisciplinary perspective to improving our, our, our influence over making this a more equitable world? Um, how do we are, you know, very much equip our students to become change agents toward that end? The faculty, I, I think, have so much to offer in that arena and because we're just starting this and we haven't sort of been seeing each other, the potential upside is just amazing. So well, that's, that's a different- that's really- Yeah. That's well, that's really a different exciting. bucket, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that's really exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to having you in person on campus and uh, seeing what you do with the leadership initiative. It's really exciting for the school. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation, which has been a lot of fun. Oh, so much um, fun. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to everybody out there that's been uh, listening and tuning in. Thanks, everybody. Take care.